everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. I'm very happy to welcome back Blake Rudis again. Hey, Blake. Hello. Blake is here to present Guiding Your Inner Artist. Awesome. Well, as usual, I want to start this off by saying thank you to Nicole and everyone at Topaz Labs for all that they do for us, not only creating amazing software for us to uh, make our photos better, but also creating a platform for us to learn from one another. So that's uh, it's awesome. I really appreciate being here. And um, so today I want to talk about guiding your inner artist. So we're going to be taking this truck picture that was taken at Fort Stevens. It's about uh, Seaside, Oregon. I just did a workshop out there with a couple people that are probably in this webinar. Hi, hi Bill. Hi, Gail. <laughs> so uh, this truck was just sitting there, and it just it, the presence of it to me screamed out it needs some artistic work done to it. Um, kind of give it that old school feel meets uh, this new age type of grunge that we like. So ultimately when I look at a scene like this um, I think to myself well what am I going to do with this later and how should I set up this shot so that I can do that later. And there's a couple things I'll talk to you about along the way that you can help guide that inner artist through these things but this is what we're going to do. We're going to start with this, and then we're going to go and make it look something like this. So kind of more of a graphic design, graphic-oriented type of look, maybe a little bit different than what you're used to seeing me do. But there's a couple things that help me get to this point. So what I'm going to do is pop up this uh, little document here that I have. This is a snippet from the PDF that is available for download. Now the focus areas, when you, when you want to get into artistic effects, a lot of people just dive right into the artistic effects and then they're off and running. You know, they they've, haven't really done the due diligence to get things right first. So my biggest suggestion to you, if you ever want to dive into this artistic realm, is number one, get all the technical aspects right first. So you have to make a technically good photograph, uh, and then you want to get the tone and the color right in that image also, and then move into the artistic effects. The thing is, you have to set yourself up with a workable palette. Now, if you saw the, the very beginning of that shot, uh, it, it doesn't look very good at all. And here's the beginning of this shot. It's uh, not really properly exposed, but I was trying to expose for the long exposure. I think this is about a two-minute long exposure. Really wanted a lot of cloud movement. Uh, so you have to set yourself up with something right. If I were to just try to do some artistic effects on this image right away, it would not have the, uh, the power that it will have when we're done. So, And there's another benefit to that. Not only do you get the image right first, you also get a chance to save it as a technically perfect photograph before you start jumping into the artistic stuff. So you can save it twice. You can save it as the technically perfect photograph and you can save it as the artistically perfect photograph. That gives you the liberty to do anything you want as your style starts to develop as an artist. Now a lot of people in here are probably like, he's talking all this jargon about being an artist. And here's the deal. If you think that you're just a photographer right now, I want you to clear that stuff out of your mind now because you will not progress further as the artist that you want to be if you're saying, I'm just a photographer. Someone comes up to you and says, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm just a photographer. No, you're not. You are an artist. If you don't start thinking that way, uh, then you won't progress in the direction that you want to progress. Uh, I have to hammer that really hard right now because there's three things that people typically say about the whole artistry thing. Is uh, Number one, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could be an artist or I don't know how to be an artist or I can't be an artist because of this limiting factor. Well, get all that junk out of your head and if you're doing this stuff today, if you're in this webinar today, you are an artist. You are not a photographer. All right. So think of it this way. You are uh, main category artist, subcategory photographer. Cool? We clear? All right. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up in Adobe Camera Raw because that's where I need to start. So all I'm doing is opening the raw file right in Adobe Camera Raw. And there's a couple things I need to get straight first. First thing is exposure. So I'm going to jack up the exposure here a little bit to about plus two. Now you're thinking, well, that's great, but you lost your sky. Well, the highlights are contained in the sky, so I'll bring those highlights down to about uh, just negative 100. Basically, I'm trying to get this exposure just right. And then I'll bring these shadows up because I really want to open up this truck. And you might be thinking, this looks like a really bad HDR image right now, Blake. And you're right, it, it kind of does. You know, the shadows are really opened up here. But there's a couple of Topaz products that I'm going to use that are going to help me in that department. So really what I'm worried about now is just getting a nice 
baseline image that has all the dynamic range available to me that I can exploit further. I often talk about uh, editing photos as an exploitation process or an interrogation process, and that's exactly what this is. Now in the whites, if we move the whites down, we'll also start to bring out some of those clouds. So I'll move those whites down to about here. And really, that's all I need to do right now, except for one more thing. I'm going to zoom in right here and make sure I don't have any chromatic aberration. So you see that little purple thing right there and that little cyan guy right here? It might be kind of hard to see on your screen, but they're there. Those are chromatic aberrations, and they manifest themselves as these little gremlins, as I like to call them, because they are just annoying. Um, you just go ahead and go into your Remove Chromatic Aberrations here. It's in your Lens Corrections under Color. So you might see your profile here where you can update your lens profile corrections. For this specific image, I don't need to do anything else with those chromatic aberrations except for press Remove Chromatic Aberration because it pretty much gets rid of it right off the bat. However, if you have a really stickler of, of a chromatic aberration, you can just move these amounts over to the right and then adjust the hue accordingly if you have an issue. These don't seem to have an issue. So another thing is if I were to go into my profile and enable lens profile correction, that's going to uh, take my wide angle lens choice that I, that I used and warp it to make it look more, uh, I guess, uh, technically correct. Now the thing with me, as I love a wide-angle lens. I love a really good wide-angle lens because I love the way it distorts the nature of things. Now, this isn't for everyone. If this is something that you do with yours, go ahead and enable lens profile corrections at this point to get that technically perfect photograph before you start editing. But for my purposes, I don't really, I, I like my wide-angle lenses and I like the effect that I get from them because I like how bulbous and monolithic this Trux looks. If I do this, then it just kind of resembles what it would look like with a 50 millimeter lens if I were to walk back, I don't know, 15 or 20 feet. So for me, I like to have that bulbous type of effect from that. So I'm just going to go ahead and open image. So in camera roll, I basically just got my settings right. All right, I didn't need to do anything crazy. All I need to do is just open this image up so that when I go into things like uh, Topaz Clarity, I can bring this to the next level. Now, you might be thinking, well, it's a great thing that you can take an underexposed photo and have all this great, uh, you know, greatness in the image. But if you look a little closer, those areas of shadow, they open themselves up and look like really bad noise, especially the color noise spots here. I'll zoom in even closer so if, if you're at home you can see this a little bit better. There's color noise in here. It's really noisy. And this was ISO 100, all right? So if we have an ISO of 100 and we have that kind of noise, it comes from taking the image a little bit too far. That's where denoises come in. So I'm going to go ahead and press Command or Control J, duplicate this image, and I'll just rename this denoise, okay? And I'll go into Filter, Topaz Labs, and denoise 5. So a couple things I love about denoise. The first one is the fact that their presets are just awesome. You just click a preset and you're pretty much good to go. Uh, now if you go into something like JPEG Strongest, you're going to get quite a bit of j noise reduction there. Uh, there's also debanding. Raw Strongest, you're going to get the, that this is a raw file that I started with, so I start with that preset. Now, as I look at this, there's a couple of things I can do in Denoise if I look right over here on this right-hand side. Now, if you look at the noise here, if I click on this, you'll get a preview of the before and after. I'll zoom in a little bit closer so you can see this. Let me uh, change this over here to, let's say, 200%, and I'll just grab, and you can look right in here, because that's what I'm mainly concerned with. I'm mainly concerned with all my shadow noise that I'm receiving at this point. So I can increase the shadow noise here, and actually what that's doing is it's reducing the noise specifically just in the shadows. So if I look at the adjust highlight, I can see if there's any noise that's being reduced in the highlight areas. With this one, I'm not really concerned with that because I don't really have the noise in the highlights. I have it in my shadows. There's another thing here with the clean color. So you can see there, there's noise, there's color noise on top of this shadow noise. So if I go into this clean color, I can move this up quite a bit, and you'll watch that color noise just start to disappear. So now I don't have that color noise. But look at the amount of detail that is still here on this tire. If you look right here specifically on this tire, some noise reduction methods end up leaving you uh, with just a very blurry image, whereas this, I still maintain all of that detail in this highlight area. So it's not it's not reducing the noise on a global level, it's doing it very selectively as I make my adjustments. So 
You can also look in the individual channels as well. In this one, I don't think I have to worry too much about the uh, individual channels as far as the blue channel and the red channel. Maybe just a little bit up on the blue channel would help. And you can see up here, it even tells you where that noise would be in these individual channels. So that's actually pretty helpful too. So for this point, I'm just going to press OK because you can still see that there's quite a bit of noise here. I have a couple feelings about noise. One of my first feelings about noise is that all pictures are created from pixels. And pixels at their most minute level are essentially noise, right? So I'm not trying to smooth this out and make it look like pudding, all right? I'm just trying to get uh, that noise to be less uh, vibrant, especially color noise. Color noise is something I just don't want to deal with. But, you know, even just having a little bit of grain there is not a problem. But there's also another way that I can modify this noise, and that's going to be done in Topaz Detail that I'll do in a couple steps here. So I'm going to go ahead and press OK. So I did mention about other, other noise reduction methods, like Photoshop noise reduction uh, can be quite harsh because it's a global noise reduction. It does have quite a bit of sliders in there, but it's not quite as intuitive as denoise. So keep that in mind here, because there's always that question, well, couldn't you have done that in, in Camera Raw, or couldn't you have done that in Photoshop? And the answer is quite possibly yes, but not to this degree. Okay, so now I'm going to press Command or Control J, duplicate this layer, and I'm going to call this Clarity, because before I go into detail, I'm going to go into Clarity, because as I said before, our focus areas, our first focus area was technically perfect images. So the technical perfection here was making sure that we had something good out of Adobe Camera Raw, a good base to work off of, that was free of chromatic aberrations, and just right, essentially. Now I'm going to move into, more specifically, tone. I want to get that tone to the point that I actually reduce those shadows back again. So, you know, there's also that question, well, you just took this image from Adobe Camera Raw and you exploited how much dynamic range was in there. Now you're going to go into Clarity and you're going to uh, add some of that back. And one of the best analogies I have for this is kind of like if you ever have a, a fractured bone to the point that it can't be fixed. In that case, the doctor might just break it. All right, so they'll break that bone in order to let it heal the correct way. That's kind of what we're doing with these images. We have an image that, that could quite possibly be fixed in Adobe Camera Raw, but we have a better method that can make a better photo, and that's going to be done right here in Topaz Clarity. First thing I do here is look at my histogram. I always go to my histogram first because my histogram is going to tell me quite a bit of information, especially in Clarity. So think of Clarity as your tone monster okay that's what this program is for now for most intents and purposes I don't use presets for, for this because I'm, I'm very specific on where I want my tones to be so I'll go into my histogram and I'll look at this more specifically now if I were to zoom into this truck here I know that when I was on the scene that day there was quite a bit of dew that was kind of running down this truck so I'm gonna see if I can bring that back with some of that micro contrast here and this might be something for detail, Topaz detail to bring out, because if I take this micro contrast too far, I might be incurring some, some more noise down here. So I'll bring that uh, up just a, quite a bit, just a little bit up there. And then in detail, we'll, we'll start to bring out a lot more of that dew that's kind of running down the side of this vehicle. At this point, I'm going to zoom out just so I can kind of show you what the tone corrections are going to be doing to the inside of this truck. And also pay attention to the histogram. Your black data is on the left hand side and your white data is on the right hand side so you know that what we did there already we started to push our white contrast further over in the histogram so let's take a look at the low contrast here so with the low contrast I'll just go ahead and push this over a little bit and one of the things here is that the difference between micro contrast low contrast medium contrast high contrast you have to kind of think to yourself these individual sliders are kind of like Adobe Camera Raw's clarity slider broken down into four powerhouse editing tools, all right? Um, they are very powerful because they edit your contrast from the most minute level to the highest level instead of one big global adjustment. So, yeah, in Adobe Camera Raw, you've got a couple of contrast sliders. You've got a contrast, which is essentially a big clarity slider, and then you have your clarity slider, which is your small contrast slider. But here, you have sliders that are even more minutely uh, affecting your image. So that's why I really like Topaz Clarity quite, quite a lot. It's a, it's a powerful program. And then we'll go ahead and move up the medium contrast a bit here. And if you see that my histogram is pushing really far on the left, I'm not too concerned with that right now. I'm just worried about getting that technically perfect toned image. Okay? And then I'll move that high contrast up just to quite, 
quite a bit. And you'll see that, as I was telling you before, I, I'm, I'm not really too concerned with that noise being reduced 100% in these black areas. Because if we look at this right now, this is our before, and those areas wouldn't quite print like black. Now, our eye thinks that that's black, but now look at this. We have we have pure points of black there, and that's exactly what we want. So I'm going to zoom out quite a bit more so we can see this truck on a, on a better level. So you can see that as you edit this tone, you're creating depth in your image, and that's really important to remember here, that tone creates depth. So I'll put our histogram here. If I move our black level to the left, you'll see our histogram pushes really far to the left. Well, these are kind of like your, after you've done your contrast controls, these are your big controls to get you back where you kind of should be. Okay, so we've done all the little minute contrast things that are going to be affecting our midtones, and now let's start to push these to their uh, their farther out levels, essentially. So if I were to bring this to the right to the point that no black exists, at this point, there is no black point in this image. But I really need there to be black underneath this wheel well. So I'm going to bring this down until I start to get black under the wheel well. I want you to look at the histogram and know that the histogram is can be your best friend, but let the histogram be data, okay? Don't don't just always think that, oh, well, I have to have, uh, I can't have anything blowing out or pushing over to the far left. Well, and that's not always the case. Have you ever heard of high key images and low key images? Well, their histograms are all over the place. Don't necessarily worry too much about the histogram. Let it be your data that you can make an intuitive decision upon. So now let's go to the highlights here, the white level. If I push this over to the right, you can see that I'm pushing my histogram so far over that the whites blow out. That's what a blowout is. So I'll move this to the left until it doesn't blow out anymore, until my white point just barely touches that edge, and it looks like it's going to be around uh, the negative 14 or 15 point. And now with the midtones, this is where I could go into the midtones and start to spread my midtones throughout the histogram. Look what happens when I push this over. You'll see that the histogram starts to favor the midtones, start to favor the whites, and now the midtones are starting to favor the dark areas. So you can do that. Just wanted to show you what's possible there. I'll just go just a little bit. And to me, that looks really good. All right. So now at this point, I could go into color too. That's what I love about clarity. As I told you before that we need to modify tone and we need to modify color before we start to get into our artistic effects. Well, clarity can satisfy both of those if you go down here to these hue saturation adjustments. So if I wanted to, I could go down here to maybe the saturation and the color yellow. Maybe amplify that a little bit. I mean, we are doing something artistic now. I'm not going to bring it all the way up here because that just looks like really bad uh, things. Okay, so we're just going to maybe boost that yellow just a slight bit and then maybe make the hue just a slight bit more yellow so it's not so uh, pungent green. And here's our before and our after. So we're starting to get better results already. We can do the same thing with our orange. And if you look under the car, that's going to be our orange area. So if I move this up a little bit, maybe go into the luminance. Your hue is basically going to change the, the overall color of the color orange and maybe make it more uh, green if we push it to the right or more red if we push it to the left. If I go to my luminance, I can make that orange a little bit darker. And that's about right. That's about where I'll leave it for clarity. So now I'm going to jump into Topaz Detail and I'm going to fix some of that noise that you saw in the wheel well using Topaz Detail. And you might be thinking, well, detail, isn't that something that you use for uh, sharpening? Well, yeah, we're going to do both. We're going to sharpen this up a little bit, but we're also going to fix some of the noise in our shadows. So I'm going to call this Detail. And I'll press OK. So we're going to go into Filter, Topaz Labs, Detail 3. The way Detail is uh, spelled out, on the right-hand side, you're going to see three uh, different areas that you can modify Detail. Sometimes we get hung up on the overall detail that you're going to see there. And the overall detail will be uh, our detail as a global whole for the entire image. So like I said before, here's your overall, here's your shadow, here's your highlight. Now you can modify these independently and get very good results. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in right about here because this is where my focus point was. I always use manual focusing live view so I know exactly where I focused on. That way when I go to edit, I know what I'm sharpening. I know what I'm reducing the noise in because if you're reducing the noise in something that you focused on, well, you might be just blurring the junk out of something that you really wanted to be nice and, uh, and neat. So I'm going to go to 200% here. And here's the do that I was talking about, and here is the shadow noise. So let's go into our shadows first. So in the shadows slider, you have your small details. See, if I bring that up, it's going to sharpen noise in my shadow area. Well, you don't really necessarily want your 
shadow noise to be sharpened. So bring the small details down. And look, this is almost kind of like denoise in a sense. It's reducing the noise in my shadows, but not even affecting my highlights at all, period. That's a very good thing. So if we go down to small details boost and bring that down, that's even going to further reduce the noise in that wheel well area. Now I said I do want some pits and pockets of grain there, so I'm going to leave that there. I don't want this to be a blurry, muddled mess. That'll be enough for me. Just the small details, just enough to round that off. So now let's zoom up here and let's go to our highlights. So with the highlights adjustment here, we can go into our small details of our highlights and watch how that dew starts to just jump off of the canvas here. Now if I bring it up this high, it's going to be a really crunchy, almost bad HDR looking photograph. So I'm not going to do that too much. I'm just going to go ahead and bring this up just a slight bit here. And then I can do the same thing with the details boost. Just bring that up just a slight bit. When I talk a slight bit, I mean like 0 0.01. Just barely boost that up just a slight bit. And then if we go into our medium details, we can kind of boost that up too. I typically don't venture into my large details too often here because they seem to be too big of a surface area to work off of. So let's go ahead and look at our before. Here's our before. Here's our after. So this is the minute technical stuff I'm talking about, getting down to this minute detail before you get into your artistic effects. Getting this done will ensure that your photo, prior to any artistic work at all period, you're going to have the best possible outcome of image to work on. So at this point, we can go ahead and press OK. I don't need to do too much with the overall details. If I did, you're going to see that it's going to boost the detail in the overall image. So that's your shadows and your highlights. I mainly just want to focus on the shadows and the highlights independently. So you can see that there, there is quite a bit of presets here, but I, I'm not a very big preset kind of guy if you've ever seen the stuff that I do. Um, I tend to look at my image and see what the image needs as opposed to work off of a preset. However, it does take quite a bit of time. I wouldn't say skill per se. It takes time and experimentation to understand what your image is going to need. So if you're new to this stuff, use the presets. If you like it, do it. If you don't, come over here and just start moving things at random, all right? And you'll get something that you like, and when you move them at random, make mental notes. Oh, when I do this, this happens. It's cause and effect. That's how you learn this stuff. That's how you guide that inner artist. It's cause and effect. When I was a painter, it was if I make this brush stroke combined with these two colors, oh, it kind of makes that look for me, so I don't have to worry about blending those colors later. It happens with the brush. Cause and effect. Everything is cause and effect, whether you're painting or you're editing images. So we'll just go ahead and press OK. So as you see here, I tend to work in uh, with these webinars with my images uh, not as smart objects. Now this could very well have been a smart object with all of these filters below it. The reason why I don't do that for webinars particularly is because smart objects tend to slow down my machine and I don't want to do that now. So that if you have a question about well, can you do this with smart objects, you very well can do this with smart objects if that's what you're comfortable with. So at this point I have modified tone. I'm going to do one quick thing for color because I already did something in clarity for color. I'm just going to go down here and go to vibrance and just bump up the vibrance a little bit. All right, so that's going to give me some color to work off of with impression later. All right, so I'm just going to bump that up to about plus 30. And the thing that vibrance does, I told you about cause and effect. Vibrance, technically speaking, amplifies your saturation in your images while protecting midtones. Specifically, I would think they made this for portrait work. But what I see it does, it gives me a nice amount of saturation in all the areas of the photo that need more saturation. So that's why I use Vibrance for this. I'm just going to boost that up just a slight bit. So at this point, I need to jump into Remask to separate this truck prior to running impression. So I'm going to press Control, Alt, Shift, and E. That's Command, Shift, Option, E on a Mac. Your hand will look like a claw. Urgh, you know, like a pirate claw. All right. So we're going to go and just call this Remask. Okay. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to go to Filter, go to Topaz Labs, and go to Remask. And I really just want to pull this truck away from the rest of the canvas. And you'll see it made another layer there for me. And I did that on purpose. I'll show you why in a little bit here. But I'm not entirely concerned with making the back of this truck uh, too perfect of a mask. So I really want to focus my attention from here forward because I know going into it that I'm going to make this look as if it's been drawn into the past or future, or however you want to look at it. 
going to zoom in. The beauty of Remask is it's going to start your image green, meaning keep this stuff because it's green. And then as you paint with blue, these are going to be your trouble areas. I tend to use a smaller brush and just trace around the entire object. Now, the reason why I use a small brush is because if you, it's like, uh, what's that, that term that they use in war movies? Aim small, miss small. So if you use a small brush, that's going to help you because it will make a better mask in the end that you have to do a little bit of less work to. Now, there's, there's several ways that I've shown using remask. One of them is to paint smiley faces all over the place, which is just a clever way to basically reduce skies. But when you have an image like this where there's quite a bit of detail around the image, it's best to make a small mask uh, outline with your blue brush. So yeah, it's going to take a little bit more time and uh, for you while you're working that's not that big of a deal but for me while I'm doing a webinar that means that I have to talk more to keep you engaged so that you don't go into your email and not want to watch what I'm doing. So I'm just going to keep tracing around this and get everything in there with that blue. Basically what you're trying to do here is make sure that the outline of the vehicle or whatever it is that you're trying to mask will stay in the inside of the blue. So you have a little bit on both sides. Now, if you notice, I'm not going over to the left-hand side and grabbing the hand as I move around. I'm actually pressing the space bar, which is a hot key for moving. So if I press and hold space bar, I can then grab and move this image around. That's a very cool technique to understand because as you're working on this, what you'll find out is that if you uh, had to stop every time you needed to move because you were using the small brush, it's quite a pain. Another cool technique is if you press and hold shift from the last point that you were drawing, it will make a straight line. Boom, look at that. I just blew your mind. All right, so press and hold shift and just go along here and that will make a straight line. So that can speed up your workflow too. So between the hand trick with the space bar and the using this to make straight lines, that is awesome. And that's not just a hotkey in Topaz. Now, Topaz is really smart when they make these things because they make, they usually use all of the same hotkeys that Photoshop would use, which is very awesome for anyone who basically lives their life on hotkeys. And uh, I think if they didn't have such a clever name, I probably wouldn't use them. But I'm just going to go ahead and, and press and hold Shift to make that straight line and keep going around. Hopefully you're still engaged and not working on your email because this is definitely going to be a lot more fun than your email as we go through here. Okay. So there's my basic image, uh, and after I've drawn that whole thing in blue, this is kind of like the old MS Paint days. I don't know if you're ever like me, but when I was a kid, I used to like, try to take my head off of objects and put on other objects in MS Paint. <laughs> it was a complete nice nightmare. Uh, but MS Paint was like if you made a line around something, like a circle, and you wanted to fill everything else around it, you just got the paint bucket and you went like this. And it, hopefully, <laughs> if you traced everything just right, then you wouldn't have it fill in your other area. So make sure that all of your blue lines touch all the way around, and then we'll just go ahead and press Compute Mask. What this is going to do, it's going to run some crazy algorithm that knows exactly what I wanted to be reduced out of here. So if I zoom in oop, and press that space bar and get that hand, we can look around here and see if it made a decent mask. And typically it does. If it doesn't, I'll just get that blue brush again and just kind of come into these areas and hit them with the blue brush until it decides uh, whether that, that area needs to be stay or not on the pixel base. Sometimes you need to go into green and just kind of fix up and doctor up that mask as you go. And that will pretty much work for now. I'm not worried about making this a perfect mask because I'll show you a trick, especially with this type of image that we're going to be doing now. So let me go ahead and zoom out here. This looks pretty good. I'll just go ahead and press OK after I've computed the mask. So now it doesn't look like it did anything, but I do have a mask here because this underlying layer was that remask. It made a copy and it put that mask on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm on this remask layer here, I'm going to rename this impression. I'm going to do my first impression layer here. So I'm going to go to filter, Topaz Labs, impression. What this is going to do is it's going to impression what's underneath the truck. So this is going to be my first separation between the truck or the object per se and the background. Now if you're looking at this truck and you want to do something very similar to this in your own imagery, you're going to have to shoot the object in a perspective base. So if you just tried to photograph the front of the truck, it's not going to work quite as well. You're going to want to make sure that there's a, a zooming perspective, a one-point perspective where this, in, where this truck starts to go back into this distance. At this point, I think we have almost a two-point perspective because there's some going off in this distance too, but just keep that in mind that you want to have this in perspective. 
So I'm going to go over here into uh, just the featured section and I'm going to select colored pencil. The idea behind this is I want to make it look like this truck has been drawn onto a piece of paper but it's kind of starting to emerge and life is going to come out of it from this pencil drawing. So when I go into there, I want to go into the settings and in particular I want to increase the spill quite a bit and I also want to decrease the coverage because when I decrease the coverage I get kind of this the paper in the background and I think it gives it this kind of vintage look especially for this image and that's cool with me. I like that. There's a lot of really awesome things you can do with uh, Impression. It's one of my favorite Topaz plugins out there because of all the ways that you can incorporate it into your workflow. So I'll go ahead and press OK. So at this point we have the impression background but look our truck because we made a mask and it's above this is now still visible. So this is pretty cool. Another thing I want to do though is create another impression layer on top of this impression layer and then have them kind of blend together. So I'm going to press Command or Control J and duplicate this. This will be impression copy 2. Go to filter, go to impression. So I'm basically running impression twice. So I'm running impression on the actual image and then running impression on top of impression. So you can, you can get these mixed type of media looks that way. And I really like the way that turns out too. So with this one, I'm going to select DaVinci Sketch 1. And I really like the way this looked, but as I was building this image, it didn't quite match um, the overall look that I wanted in the end. I still needed some color there. I didn't want it to look like a pencil or a charcoal sketch. So I'm going to go into the settings here. And the only thing I really want to change here is the paper color. So down here under texture you're going to see background. Notice how the background is brown here. Well I can change that background to white. So I'm going to change that background to white. And another thing I'm going to do here is just drop the opacity here to about 70%. So what that's going to do is it's going to give me the colored pencil look underneath the charcoal look. So it's kind of a mixed media type of effect. And I'll press OK. Now mixed media, if you're not, not fond of that word, that basically would be if someone's using maybe gouache paint with watercolor or uh, watercolor with colored pencil, where they watercolor an image first and then maybe go back in and fine tune the detail with colored pencil. Or in this case, we did colored pencil first and then some charcoal on top. So now that that's at 70%, it looks pretty good. We're showing some of the stuff from underneath. Now we kind of need the magic to all happen. So I'm going to add the truck back. So the truck is now back, or in your case, whatever you're working with, the object is now back. I'm going to click on the mask. So on the mask here, I'm going to get the gradient tool. And this gradient tool, I'm just going to grab right here at the back of this truck, press and hold shift, and move it over. I'm basically adding to this mask. You see how now the truck is starting to, to come forward, like it's been drawn in on the back, and now the truck is coming forward. Pretty cool technique here. All right, so if we look at that before and after, it's pretty neat. But... Uh, there's still some things that aren't quite jiving with me. It looks art like it's artificially placed. So one thing that I do want to do to make this look more like it's boosting out, it's got this vibrant look behind it, is to do what they do in Hollywood. You put a spotlight behind it. So we're just going to make a new layer right behind this object, and we're going to press B for the brush tool, the right bracket key to make it a little bit bigger, and then we're going to make sure our default tools are selected. Press D for default so we get black and white in our palette, Press X for white, and boom. Notice I use a lot of hotkeys. I like hotkeys. So I really like the way that looks. It's just It kind of looks like it's boosting away from that drawn background, but I'm going to drop that opacity just a slight bit to about 80%. So now we have this kind of uh, spotlight type of look where the back of the truck looks like it now has a place. In the spotlight here, we can even move this if we wanted to. We can move this more in this area so that it looks like it's highlighting the top of this truck and looks like there's a light source coming there from somewhere. So another thing I need to do is give this a shadow. Now if I just were to go in here and go double click on this and go to drop shadow, uh, you'd see that the drop shadow goes all over the place. It goes behind it, it goes in front of it. If I move the distance, it doesn't quite look right. So I'm going to make my own drop shadow. This is a pretty interesting technique when you're doing composite work. I'm press Command or Control J to duplicate that background layer. I'm also going to press Control and click on the truck. Oop, hold on one second, Control D. Before I do that, I need to right click here and go to Apply Mask. That's going to apply that mask to this truck. And the only thing I need this truck here for is my shadow. So if I press Control and click on this, that's going to give me the outline of just my truck. You see that? So if I press Shift F5, that will fill this. You can also go to Edit and go to Fill. I'll fill it with black. 
looks horrible. I know. Thanks. I'm going to grab this and just move it right underneath my truck. So now that it's under my truck, I can use the Move tool, move it underneath, and then I'm going to go to Filter, go to Blur, Gaussian Blur, and blur the junk out of this. I mean, blur it to about 100%, 100 pixels. That'll be good. All right, so now that that's blurred, it's starting to look kind of like a shadow. Let's do another blur. Let's do Filter, Blur, and do Motion Blur. And then the Motion Blur will give us um, a more blurring effect underneath that truck, which looks pretty good at this point. But as you can see, let's take the eyeball off and eyeball on, that shadow is still all over the place, very similar to the problem that we had before. So I'm going to create a mask. I'll put a mask on here, and anything I paint with black on this mask will force things to go away. So I can just push this away. If, if you need help with this, download that PDF, because everything I'm doing here is in that PDF. So I'm kind of like uh, on speed edit mode, um, and it's normal for me. I did about 45 to 50 push-ups and a couple sit-ups before this, so I get all jazzed up and amped up and ready to go. also helps that I'm editing an army truck. <laughs> Um, but look at that PDF because that PDF has all of these steps that I did and will outline it exactly as you're seeing me work here. So now my shadow looks a little bit more natural. All right, so it looks like it's actually placed underneath that vehicle. You still have the freedom to move this around if you see fit also. One thing we might need to do here is drop the opacity down to about 60% so it's not so striking. All right? The beauty of this is if we look at our original truck, and look at it now. We can actually go into the mask of that original trunk, truck and change the density of that if we wanted to so that more of that kind of comes through, more of the background kind of comes through. That's an option so that we actually have some of that detail back there. I kind of like the way it looks. But from here, you're not just stuck with uh, what we did in, in Remask or the mask that we've created. You can still paint in with black, with black around this truck to make certain parts kind of seamlessly integrate, like maybe go around the sides of the truck here, maybe go around the tires to make this look like it really does seamlessly integrate into the rest of the, of the painting slash uh, drawing that we've got in the background there. And that looks pretty good. I, I like the way that looks now. That's something I might not have shown in the PDF, but I like it. At this point, we're almost done, okay? I'll spare you. You're almost done. The last thing I want to do here is color grade this to make it looks like make it look like it all belongs together and unified. So I'm gonna make another 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 stamp. I'm gonna use that claw, the R, Control, Shift, Alt, and E on the visible layer, and that will make a new layer on top. Now, basically, what that stamp means is that if I turn the eyeball just on this, it's the only layer you're seeing, and it's all the work that happened below it. If I turn this eyeball off, now you don't see any of that work down there. So what I want to do, and this is a great way if you want to edit something further, but you don't want to destroy everything that you've done underneath. I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and Restyle. Restyle is a great way to color grade your images because you get a lot of control over the color. And if you look at this, there are a ton of different things that you can use uh, to make the look that you want from this. And I would venture to tell you that even some of these that you're like, oh man, that's that's not going to look good, like this one. Like, ooh, that is vibrant. <laughs> that's not going to look good if you do anything with that. Even the worst looking color grade in here can look the best very easily. The one thing that you want to focus on here, the magic of restyle happens with your blending mode and your opacity. So I'm going to change this blending mode to soft light. It's already starting to look better. I'm giving this kind of a pastel look, all right, and drop the opacity now to about 50% or even lower. Now, the whole thing has this nice color to it, and it's almost unified in a way because the way the colors are spreading over all of the work that we've done. Because we did some work with one, did some color work with another, we separated it. All this stuff needs to come together. So the last thing you should do on any composite work is to bring it all together with color grading. And at this point, because you're in Restyle, you could modify these colors individually if you'd like. The one thing I suggest you do if you do want to know where these colors are coming from is that you do increase the opacity all the way and then increase the saturation all the way so that you know that the secondary color is this and then the uh, primary color is going to be this and then your fourth color and third and, and so on and so forth. I don't need to do anything with these per se, so I'm just going to set these back to where they were. I just want you to know that that ability is possible. You can also maybe uh, increase the luminance of certain areas so that this whole area gets a little bit brighter, which doesn't look too bad. So I'll change that to soft light and I'll drop this down to about 50%. 
All right, so there's the there's the uh, before restyle, and there's the after, and I will go ahead and open this up, and we should be almost all set. So what I really want you to focus on right now is not every single step that I took to get here. I want you to focus on uh, a couple things. The first thing is, the first thing I told you was I was already thinking about what I wanted to do to this photograph the minute I shot it. So while you're on the scene, start thinking about how you're going to post process. This is going to be hard at first, and I'll tell you why. Because anytime you're a beginning photographer, you're going to spend 95% of your time in the camera and 5% editing, which means you're only going to be thinking about editing 5% of the time while you're shooting. How's that for mind blowing? <laughs> but as you get better in the camera, and as you get better with some of these, these ideas of this artistic vision, uh, you're going to start to see that percentage flip flop. So maybe you get to the intermediate level, and uh, now you're at 50% in the camera and 50% editing. Well, that means that 50% of the time while you're in camera, you're actually going to be thinking more and more about what you're going to do afterwards. And as you transition further and further along that line, you're going to find that about maybe 10% happens of the thought in camera and 90% happens in post-processing. So 90% of the time of while you're shooting, you're going to be thinking about what you're going to be doing later. All right. So think about that. That's how you start to progress as an artist. That's how this stuff starts to just kind of come natural to you. Um, don't focus on this now. If you're a beginner, don't focus on it now. Think about tone. Think about color. Get that stuff right first because you're not going to be able to make it anywhere artistically without that. Does that mean you can't experiment? No, experiment all day long, but just know that you want to get that technical image perfect first before starting to move into your artistic realm. So download that PDF because it has everything in there that you're going to need uh, to do something similar like this on an image that you've shot in this type of perspective. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're getting a ton of awesome feedback about all the steps you just took in the beginning and after image. So thank you for showing your workflow there. Not a problem. I'll show you the, the there's the before. Yes, and please. I always forget. There's the before. <laughs> there's the after. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for all the wonderful comments coming in. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we look forward to the next one, and thank you, everybody, for joining us, and have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Take care.